Lord. Okay, so here we are again for another exciting installment of the Northern Digital Storytelling Festival 2023. And we're on session 16 this evening, which is the digital storytelling in the real world, AR and overlays. And we have a bumper session tonight because I can't count. So we have four speakers um, as well as myself and Maggie uh, as hosts for the evening. Uh, so um, I've already primed the questioners in the audience that um, we need to keep it succinct tonight um, because we'll probably have less time for questions. Uh, they've been fantastic um, over the last 15 sessions. And I don't think I've actually had to ask any of the questions I've sent you guys in advance because we've had some great questions from the audience. So a little bit less time for that tonight, but we have got um, four fantastic presentations coming up. So I'm really looking forward to them. So um, for the folk that are new here tonight, um, the format is a quick intro from me, uh, which I'm doing right now. And then we're gonna do four 15 minute presentations. I'll introduce each speaker one after the other. Um, and then we'll do a bit of Q&A with the bit of time we've got at the end and I'll have a wee chat quite a relaxed vibe, um, you know, it's just, just imagine you're having a cup of tea and a bun with your mates. Uh, that's the kind of vibe we're, we're aiming for for the festival. It's supposed to be supportive. We're trying to bring folk together that maybe normally wouldn't come together to talk about interesting stuff around um, digital storytelling, the tools and technologies that are flying in thick and fast uh, so that we can all collectively get our heads around it a little bit faster. Um, so thank you very much to our sponsors, Sign the Screen Industries Growth Network for um, funding the event uh, without whom we couldn't run it. So big thank you to them. Um, and if you want to share the session links to it with anyone or book any of the other sessions, just go to northerndigifest.co.uk and there's a session recordings tab at the top with all of the sessions and there's also um, links to book tickets there for free. It's online, accessible to all, uh, free to attend and recording. So we're trying to make it as inclusive as we can. And we have actually got audience folk booking from all over the world, which is really exciting. So, um, so I'm really chuffed about that. So I'm going to crack on because we've got loads of you. So um, I'm going to ask Damien to go first. So while Damien's starting his slides, I'll do a quick intro. Um, I say a quick intro, but they're quite in-depth intros, actually. <laughs> but I think it's nice because we're recording it on Zoom, and if you haven't met these people before, it's good to have a little bit of an overview of, of who everyone is. So, so apologies in advance if it's a bit long-winded. So Damien, uh, Dr. Damien Tomaselli is an award-winning filmmaker, the creator of Astrolabe Studios, and a postdoctoral fellow at the Visual Identities in Art and Design at the University of Johannesburg. He's a transmedia storyteller with a background that includes theatre, film and photo manipulation and currently is focused on the emerging media of virtual reality, mixed reality and motion book technology. His recent projects include the launch of an augmented reality comic book at Comic Con Africa. And for tonight, uh, Damien's going to talk about the frame of a painting influencing the composition of that painting. The playable space in a video game works seamlessly with the objectives of the game and in turn determines narrative significance within that game. In augmented reality, a digital overlay blends with real world spaces. AR and overlays merge the real world, world and fictional and therefore these overlays will work with the real world in producing AR narratives. Over to you, Damien. Thank you, Heather. Uh, this is a scary part for me is sharing the presentation, which doesn't always work nicely for me. And um, I'm pensing fake now because I can't find it. So I've got a copy here. You... Is it showing? Not yet. No. Mm. Okay. It's a problem with Zoom. My computer hates Zoom. Okay. I can share um, this end. Okay. Thank you. No problem. All right. So, um, Oh, and I've got the wrong slide open on my side anyways. <laughs> Give me two seconds. No problem. Okay. I've got tomorrow's go. one open. Okay. Um, storytelling. Can you see All that? right. So I'm not entirely sure how much detail to go into, but it's only 15 minutes. So I'm going to say that most people understand what AR is who are listening to this talk, but uh, in terms of anyone who might not understand when we're talking about AR, the way that I understand AR is that it's a augmented reality overlay on top of a screen. I think where we're going um, in future that that will change as the technology changes. So if um, Apple can ever sort out a headset for AR glasses, then we might start thinking about AR in terms of uh, some sort of cross reality functionality, but I think 
in general, we understand that for the most part, this is um, understood through mobile phones at the moment. If we can go to the next slide, uh, Heather. Um, so in terms of uh, AR and storytelling, the anchor for me here, I think which um, will give this uh, talk a bit of directionality is um, the, the backbone on story. Uh, because what we have when we have narrative is that we have a clear uh, structural objective, um, uh, beginning, a middle and an end, and that will help focus uh, everything else that we are trying to do in um, storytelling with augmented reality. Um, what I would like to focus on is the fact that the space is very much different to what we've been looking at previously. Um, I forgot, Heather, until you read the, the intro that I wrote all that stuff about the painting. So thank you for that. But it's a good cue because uh, when we have a painting as uh, artists paint, they tend to uh, compose in relation to the frame of what will be uh, included in the painting itself. So if we think about augmented reality in that sense, then this is a very different sort of frame. So we're not having necessarily a 2D frame, we're having a frame which is overlaid onto real world objects. And so this does a lot in terms of um, establishing meaning making. Um, I don't personally like the term overlay. The way that I think about the, the space is that uh, it becomes a, a third space. So as I said in the, the other talk that I gave on bird reality to pick up on that, uh, the idea of montage that we have in, uh, well, Eisenstein's idea of montage that uh, you have image one, you have image two, and then the overlay of image one and image two creates the third place entirely. So it's almost like a hybrid. Um, so the way I, I've got a little mirror there as a note to myself, the way that I think about it is that with a screen-based media, something like film, comics, et cetera, um, you have a Alice's reflection in the mirror. And virtual reality, I think Alice steps right through the mirror into this uh, other world. And I think in augmented reality, you're somewhere in the, in the middle of the looking glass. One step is in the looking glass, one step is outside of the looking glass. So familiar yet uh, completely different for, for the context. Um, okay, so can we go to the, the next slide? Um, so as I mentioned, the, the anchor here, which I'm focusing on is narrative. I think there's tons to talk about in terms of uh, augmented reality. And um, I, I'm sure the other, the other speakers will, will mention a lot of these points, um, but this one is going to focus on the meaning making in relation to a series of uh, chronological events that need to uh, have some sort of dramatic impact. Um, and these points, which I will elaborate on, which I also touched on in the Blurred Realities talk, um, what I refer to as identity text, sensory text, agency effect, embedded text, co-generation, ludonarrative dissonance. So this is basically the outline of what I want to get through in the next few minutes. Um, if we can go to the next slide. When I talk about identity text, identity text for me is a way of um, reminding myself that the body becomes interpolated into the meaning making process. So uh, traditionally with a frame based media, film, television, comics, what have you, there are, you know, are, there, there's the world that you are in and then the psychologically projected diegetic world that is largely uh, cognitive inside of your head and meaning making then um, works in a way in which um, the body is not necessarily playing any major role in the progression of story. And once you start bringing, this is what the findings that um, I found uh, with my own work um, in uh, augmented, uh, in an enhanced augmented reality comic, and um, the findings that I've crossed with, um, cross correlated with other researchers, uh, practitioners in the field. And once the body becomes involved in the process, then uh, meaning making then relies on uh, more bodily functions and more uh, issues such as movement, personal space, things that we might associate with the, the idea of, I don't want to steal the term presence from VR, but I'm going to steal it for convenience sake. Um, so real world relatable spatial dimensions then become part of the story, which you are then creating. And the main point that I wanted to uh, make with this slide is that semiotic re representation is born not of the mind only, but also of the body, which becomes uh, much more integrated and interpolated into the meaning making process. So we can go to the next slide. Um, now, this is a tricky one to bring into a 15 minute talk because it's, it can be quite complex, but 
for me, this is um, really where my, my studies launched from. And what I, it's a term called temporal index, which is similar to um, uh, Deleuze's idea on um, time, time image. And really what I wanna be able to say is that we have to consider temporality in any sort of visual storytelling. Um, time is not the same in narrative. Time is different in narrative. If you think of a film, you can ramp speed up, you can speed it up, slow it down. Uh, the, the story time is different from real world time. Considering the fact that we have to tell story through a progression of images uh, from one until the other, then what we're also doing is we are playing with space and we're stitching space and time together, which is not the same as the space and time that we inherit in the real world. And to identify the idea that uh, temporality, what I call the temporal index is different, I use the idea of storyboards and comics. Um, this is a pet peeve of mine, although I don't know if it's actually a pet peeve because I feel like I'll fight to the death on this point. Um, when friends say story, that comics are basically storyboards, um, and this is not the case. Storyboards are designed to uh, sample continuous space so that they can be given to a director of photography. You can then take that storyboard and effectively recreate that shot with a camera at a, at a relatively high frame rate in continuous time. Whereas uh, a comic is closer akin to something like uh, Lessing's discussions of the Leo Kuhn sculpture where meaning uh, must choose a privileged moment. And so you tend to have much more uh, verbose expressions of um, temporal rhetorics to be able to create uh, your, your, your messages through. And so I use this example to explain the, the, the temporality. But once we move into anything, uh, whether it be augmented reality, virtual reality, and even gaming that uh, works with the 3D axis, then we are reinventing temporality because we are diluting um, the temporality, we're diluting the space which means that the way that the story is told is then diluted. And one of the ways in which this manifests is through the idea that story tends to, to, to slow down in spaces such as augmented reality, virtual reality. We generally can't, um, we, we, we can't approach them with the same sort of uh, rhythmic function, um, which in, in essence means that we need to redesign the entire story. Um, so another point that we can consider there is uh, with the, other changes or the, the other points uh, that are left for the, the rest of the discussion, um, we have a different cognitive process as well. Things like interaction, for example, um, you can argue in certain instances that the cognitive load will be higher, the work needs to be a bit more or a bit more in certain ways in order for story to unfold. Anytime we have a higher cognitive load, there's generally a um, reciprocal relationship with the narrative rhythm and the story go, uh, slowing down. So the more that we look at these characteristics, the more we then need to go back to the spine of narratology and say, well, how do we still meet these narrative objectives through a, a redefined um, spatial parameter? You can go to the next slide, please. So another thing which has cropped up to, with me and which I'll speak a bit more about uh, in tomorrow's talk in transmedia is the idea of what I call co-generation. So this is something which um, is almost a, a form of, you can consider it an, a, I think a negotiation that a lot of people have seen when they're dealing with uh, augmented reality and meaning making. Uh, because of the fact that the, uh, in AR, we're generally not too passive with the content we have to try to provoke the contents or we have to react to the contents so the content provokes us. Um, and so that meaning making process is not uh, uh, as passive as figuring out the story that's being told on the edge of the, the page or the screen. It's something that you have to be uh, a part of in order for story to be able to generate. If you don't interact with it, nothing really of any significance happens and the story won't really move. So it goes back to point number one, where uh, we become interpolated into the meaning making process. Um, this also uh, ties in with the point of um, engaging on a, very, on a more personal note, which also shifts a whole lot of dynamics in terms of um, information, um, moving, moving uh, drama. So this gives rise to terms that uh, we throw around all the time, such as agency, interactivity, which is a very loaded term, means different things to different people. But Again, it, it ties into the idea that uh, we move from active observer to observational actor. 
Um, the other point here, which ties into um, the, the later points on ludo narrative dissonance, is that, um, and I don't, I, I don't quite know where I stand on this, and I need to give this more thought. But it's something that I think needs to be mentioned: is that as we start seeing, especially um, with the climate of things like Chat GPT at the moment, uh, we don't really know what we're going to do with. Um, there, there seems to be a need uh, of self-expression that comes out on the part of anyone who interacts with um, these new spaces. And combined with narrative, that has a whole host of implications because sometimes these don't necessarily work in, they don't always play nicely with each other. We've given a lot of power over uh, for these points. So I wanted to introduce that point. Um, we can go to the next slide. We have um, personalization, which ties into the intimacy of having uh, characters in your space or you being part of a, a, a common world. Again, in terms of a narrative spine, um, one of the, 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 the ideas is, well, then how do we progress narrative at all? What's stopping people from playing around all the time? How do we get to the next phase of this? Um, how do we provoke the, 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 the um, reader, interact, observer to be able to move story along? Um, so the idea of pathways comes into, into the fold. And this has been referred to, if we can go to the next slide, um, by some, um, some creators of AR as, um, for example, action texts and signs that we can enter the story's narrative, engage with the characters, and then move the story along. Um, ergonomic architectures, um, embedded narratives, uh, these are ideas borrowed largely from gaming in order to be able to try to focus um, direction and, and pathways. Um, although it's in virtual reality, I think the, the idea uh, links over to um, augmented reality where uh, researchers, uh, Newton and Sukhoff, identified what they call a matador strategy, which is almost teasing the participant to engage the sign. And when they do, uh, further signs can then uh, come up. Uh, so the next slide talks about another uh, idea, which is pretty much stolen from gaming uh, of embedded narrative. Um, so going back to the first point about we have to, well, what is the, the painting that we're looking at here? If you look at theater, for example, the way that theater is scripted from the very beginning is that we're probably going to have to take this, um, explain the, the story. It's probably going to have to, uh, exposition is going to occur within, within a stage. Don't have too many cutscenes. have a lot of action play out in one space because you know what, we have to do t uh, set changes. This is a practical limitation of what we're doing and this starts to shape the action inside. So we start to put emphasis on things like dialogue, subtext, uh, set design, colors, uh, anything really that we can bring into uh, uh, the, the arsenal of what we're doing. So the set changes that we have in AR uh, are asking the same questions. They're just getting different answers because the, the orientations are different. Um, so in terms of provoking a reaction, we have things like entry points for participation, action text. Um, going back to uh, the, the point on personalization, um, I think one of the findings with AR is that we don't overload with too much um, uh, uh, environmental information because we rather integrate into the environment that's already present. So in early designs um, for Magic Leap, the, a lot of designers would have very elaborate settings and what they started to notice is that these almost add to clutter and they can become distractionary if they're not used well. And so characters um, tend to take the forefront because that seems to be where the interaction um, is. Um, and so none of these are hard and fast rules. These are just ideas that um, I've seen as, as we've been going. And I'm not quite sure how I'm doing for time. I, I think I'm rather efficient. So, yeah. okay, so um, if I had time, which I think I do, uh, we can move to the next slide. And as I say, I'll speak more about this one tomorrow, but I thought this was something that has already come up in some of the talks um, that, that I've seen um, recently as part of Northwest. And I think it's something that as we start to add in um, elements of interactivity and um, any sort of agency or any sort of control which is taken away from story or which story has to entice or any sort of power that audiences have to co-generate uh, information. There's a term from gaming, which um, I think will be applicable here, specifically with story, um, is the, the idea of the ludonarrative dissonance. 
And effectively what this means is that it's very difficult to do two things at once. Um, it's very difficult to focus on the mechanics of the game and still be able to focus on everything necessary in order to move story. Um, this is a loaded topic and I think some people get quite, I've read the academic journal articles which sound like Reddit posts where people viciously attack other academics um, on, this, on this note, but there does seem to be an idea that it's difficult to do both. So it's difficult to always play to the interaction of character and still uh, hit all the necessary um, dramaturgical points that are necessary to um, uh, stimulate some sort of uh, emotion, which is traditionally what narrative is designed to be able to do. And I think it's an issue that's going to uh, become more and more prominent to narratologists as um, technology develops. Um, so that is pretty much my talk. I don't know how I'm doing for time. Sorry, I lost you in a mile of um, tabs there. I think you're doing fine for time. It's only 20 past, you're absolutely fine. In fact, I think it was bang on. So I appreciate that. Thank you very much for that talk. It was really interesting. Um, lots of information to take in. So um, more, more digesting required. Okay, great. I'm gonna move swiftly on if that's okay. Uh, and I'm gonna introduce our next speaker, Warren. You're up next, if that's okay. Is that okay, Warren? Yes, that's fine. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's fine, all right, that's fine. Okay, I'll just do a quick intro. Um, so, so Warren has worked with the BBC uh, Virtual Reality Studios and 3DFX departments uh, um, before setting up his own practice. He also works for York St. John University and is also doing a PhD at York University. Um, <laughs> you keep yourself busy, don't you? <laughs> so um, Warren's current P PhD work at the University of York focuses on a service design approach to implement augmented realities to support primary science education and is funded through an Unreal Education Mega Grant. He continues to lead postgraduate studies at York St. John on topics such as the fourth revolution, design thinkings and 3D technologies. He has recently established the York Virtual and Augmented Reality Research Group at York St. John University and set up a community interest company called 3DRWE. Is it 3DRWE or is it 3DRWE? 3DRWE. Yeah, we yes. <laughs> education around new immersive technologies. Over to you, Warren. Thank you very much, uh, Heather. Thank you for inviting me. No problem. Uh, shall I share my screen then, I guess? Yes. I've Is got a okay? backup if you need it, but if you want to share, that's fine. Um, I think I should be all right. I think so. How is, yeah. how is that looking? Sure. Is that OK? It is. Um, so I'll do it from the beginning. There we go. Can everyone see that? Is that OK? Brilliant. So yeah, thanks, um, Heather, for inviting me. Um, and it's a pleasure to meet everyone else. Um, Yes, my name is Warren Fern, um, and uh, my kind of kind of what I want to talk about today is more focused around using AR um, in teaching primary sciences, and that's completely due to what I'm kind of doing in terms of my PhD, and also, as Heather mentioned, um, is part and parcel of the Epic Mega Grant. So um, I will talk more. Um, so just a little bit about background, and I think it has relevance to what I'm going to talk about in the it, down the line. But um, when we talk about narratives and storytelling, I've worked on different kind of productions and um, kind of you know different kind of television productions, etc. Um, so you know from storytelling in terms of animation, 3D animation, to create to creating material for um, young children to download. Um, to kind of looking at um, virtual reality. I don't know if you remember Bamzuki, but working on that um, quite a number of years ago, which is quite interesting in terms of kind of uh, narratives and storytelling and how and gaming within that. And I think that kind of 3D kind of computer element at the start kind of really aligned to um, the kind of next thing, which someone kind of just brought in 
flippantly and said, oh, this this thing called augmented reality. Have you seen it? Um, to which I was like, what is that? <laughs> um, and um, when kind of looked at AR, I started to realize uh, this was the first thing that I kind of put together this kind of chemistry um, set for Autodesk. And it was part of a package for, for, for children to learn about the different types of uh, the periodic table. And within that, you would you would use a marker and it would trigger uh, one of the periodic table characters. It would pop up and it would say, I'm Argon, how are you today? Um, and I thought, wow, this is kind of like cool for education. I can see lots of potential. And this was probably about 2010, 2011. Um, so when I started kind of looking in, into this a lot more, uh, to cut long story down the line, um, I started to realize there were some products on the market. Um, so one being um, Wonderscope, AR Wonderscope, uh, which to be honest, is a, it's, a, it's a really great product um, in terms of augmented reality. And it's a storytelling app as well. So um, you can, you know, go around uh, your environment, your home, and this particular application will tell stories. It will bring up 3D kind of content as well. And, you know, you can interact with it. And I think what's great about that as well, when I was, when I was kind of doing a literature review, review on all these different products, is that, you know, you've got, you got capital, parental kind of capital there. So you can do the things with, with parents as well. Um, can join in so you know for me it was a great product and then you've got things like the magical park in um, based in New Zealand and um, this was called Mossland that was it to do with um, selling houses um, using AR uh, which I thought was quite interesting but I think what what was great about these two you had two kind of parallels what, what one was kind of um, you know home based say home base but it's situated in the home the other situated outside and I think that also kind of made me think about remote learning as well um, you know um, when when um, I read about the World Economic Forum it was interesting about how we might learn in the future and uh, we learn and go as they as they called it so we kind of you know and these kind of technologies for me was something where you know we can start to look at things like geolocation and where you know we're, situ we're situated in this a, a particular space um, and it will trigger something off where we can learn um, which I thought I found quite exciting <laughs> um, to be honest and also something for me personally um, you know when you talk about when we talk about learning and talk about storytelling as well you know when we read books of for, you know obviously but I thought you know in terms of AR this is kind of a new narrative um, and ways of telling it and the other things is you know tangible AR as well I thought that was this this started to get, get into some interesting territory where you've got the merge 3D cube and you can physically hold something and trigger um, you know kind of narrative storytelling and you can move it around um, and you know children can hold it and it's you know it's very safe to hold um, and then on the right obviously you know what was quite interesting at the time I remember going to the to the bet show and speaking to Lego at the time saying oh you know what you're doing with the uh, augmented reality I'm really interested in that and um, lo and behold um, they've just kind of announced that they're going to be working with Unreal on a project so um, so yeah, I think in terms in terms of these, this, tan this kind of tangible making and practicalities and triggering things, I thought that was a, an interesting kind of angle as well. So getting more towards my project that I'm doing. So as um, Heather quite rightly said, I'm looking at service design, um, something that I, I teach, but I specifically looked at service design because I think it's a really good kind of design methodology where um, you can, perform or conduct different practices and the one thing about service design as well with AR I thought was really interesting is before I look at the technology as being augmented reality how do we look at it as being a service and how does that service work in terms of all the kind of outside peripherals to that and the other thing is 
you know, the narrative, the storytelling of the product of what I was going to develop. Um, it's not me. It's not something that I can personally write in terms of primary sciences, because um, that's what I'm, you know, particularly focusing on. It's something that I need in terms of, you know, working with others, with, with other stakeholders. So people like Nikki and Katie and Emma and Jake, you know, these were the people that I could help talk about the narratives um, in science. So that really helped me. And also they understand the subject. So, you know, it's no point in me trying to write a story regarding science uh, when I don't know too much about it. Um, so in terms of that, what was interesting then, I did quite a few classroom observations. Um, I looked at storytelling within the classroom as well. How do we you know, use narratives? So through comical videos, through you know, characterization, um, and where that kind of happened, and also kind of technology like Interland that they that they were using in class as well to engage young children. Um, so those were kind of things, you know, things that I'd not kind of observed before. And then, you know, in terms of focus groups and design sprints, we were talking about, you know, how AR works for them and introducing AR as a platform, but also once again, where um, does to kind of stories sorry where do stories fit and what's the benefit of using the medium to tell stories as well which they do they did find a lot of positive um, kind of notes on that um and i think when we start when we started talking about um kind of narratives as well the one thing that was really kind of applicable was curriculum alignment so there's no point in creating kind of content or stories that don't aligned to the curriculum uh, they felt that was something that they needed to be embedded into it and um, the other thing is about appropriate language as well so what was interesting is you know if we're working with ks2 students then the language had to reflect um, and the narrative for that in some ways so that was um, an interesting kind of prospect and um other things with um, image recognition. So they were needed something where you would guide um, the student around um, as, as, you know, um, in terms of using AR, you, the spatial awareness can sometimes you can lose your spatial awareness, um, whether you're using wearables or a tablet. So that was something that was um, um, specific and also when you're kind of using these experiences, are they individual individual experiences or the group related? So, you know, are you kind of is a group working towards towards in a narrative? Are you, you know, are you listening to a narrative as a group or as, a, as an individual? So um, a little bit kind of I designed these characters um, in relation to Interland and, you know, storytelling as well. So um, I thought the, what the tutors really were saying is kind of the characters could help guide uh, help guide uh, the children around the the kind of experience and um tell tell different little stories um and they're, they're based on the platonic shapes as well so they that's the kind of relationship they've got to science um and when we started kind of talking to the to, to the children as well about um the design of this, what was interesting is they, they kind of wrote, they all, they, everyone said about Animal Crossing, which I never heard about before when they went, oh yeah, Animal Crossing, you should do that. I'm like, well, is it Animal Crossing? Anyway, um, so I kind of dug into it and thought, like, okay, this is Animal Crossing. And it was quite interesting about the, the stories, but also the way that they, the, the characters spoke as well. They had this like kind of high pitched voices. And um, so what we did as part of that, we developed a, a system where you could type into Unreal and we coded it. So um, you could type it in and it would come up on the left hand side on one of the characters and it would make different sound noises as well. So we use phonetics to kind of connect that all together. So we've got these little characters um, now speaking like Animal Crossing. And, and in terms of um, the AR, AR interaction, in terms of storytelling, they, they thought about themes, which was climate change. So one being renewables, one being habitats, one being materials, one being healthy living, and one being earth science. 
So what we did uh, together is we I started to storyboard different stories around narratives of, around learning and also around curricular um, curriculum, excuse me, um, in light alignment. So one being renewables. So the one thing that we, we looked at is wind turbines and how wind turbines might work and operate. And that would be useful in terms of the curriculum. Likewise, in terms of materials, we were looking at, we, we did a, a whole script. Um, so this is just part of it, but we looked at kind of reduce, reuse and recycle the three R's. So how the character can in, interact with that and talk about um, the three R's as well. And likewise, habitats, uh, we looked at, you know, different habitats like the rainforest. So I, I kind of started sketching the storyboard and ideas and concepts whilst uh, the teachers and the, the science educators like Nikki and Emma and Jake kind of wrote some some scripts around it and narratives and uh, yeah and the, and the cow eat, uh, the cow with healthy eating which I learned quite a lot actually myself from doing it um, about how many stomachs a cow has and where they burp and you know everything else uh, methane so it's, it was really fun and um, earth sciences so obviously global warning this is you know a big thing so we kind of designed some kind of sketches and ideas around that so I think just getting on, I suppose, to make the point there, it's the collaboration moment. It's about collaborating and it's about working together, which was really important to, to kind of fruition. And then um, started building this, um, designing it, making it, modeling it, UV texture mapping it, and, um, you know, animating it. So kind of looking at the story, but I think also, which is really interesting there is how the kind of space works as well, where the characters pop up um, and the size of it as well. I think that's one thing, you know, do you have a large cow in front of you? Do you have a small cow? Um, you know, these were these were things that the kids, actually the kids were, you know, feeding back to me in terms of how the storylines or how things as well in AR should, um, should present themselves. So we did a lot of coding as well, using blueprinting. Uh, we used, we used markers, produce markers and um, I didn't do the code and I can't take the credit for that, but um, we, we uh, the other people did the, the blueprinting behind it. So we, we created something quite unique for Unreal actually that they've never done before. And we've cre we created and tested David, on David Bowie records and all sorts of other stuff, um, but to trigger things and these characters, you know, um, pop up, they ask questions, they talk, they tell a narrative, they tell a story, and then you follow them. And it's part of the, what is a, essentially an AR cardboard pop-up exhibition for, for primary sciences. Um, so yeah, and, and it was quite interesting, their interaction as well, um, in, in, terms of, in terms of doing that. In terms of interaction as well, the narrative, so telling the story, I think one, one thing was really crucial is sound as well. So, you know, as we um, looked at creating the 3D animation and storytelling about, you know, for example, here about renewables and how wind turbines work. I think what was really essential is we got um, John, I got John involved, who did all the sound for it as well. So, you know, the sound was really important in terms of engaging young people and um, also kind of, you know, telling, telling the story, storyline uh, within it. And that's it. That's, uh, that's the kind of thing that we've been developing. And um, I hope that kind of gives you a brief idea. Is that okay, Heather? Yeah, thank you very much. That was really great. Thank you, Warren. Thank you. Uh, really interesting. And, and uh, nice to see some friends from a past previous life yes you know, my first job when i got to york was working for ciec <laughs> about 20 yeah. years ago now it's amazing um so yeah so great to see some of the work that's coming through there for primary kids um so yeah great thank you okay shreyans are you happy to go next or would you yes to happy to yeah? yeah cool all right i'll introduce you next then marvelous are you still with us you've frozen we try to share my screen till then Okay, cool. Okay, so Shreyans Jane is a creative and analytical marketeer. He has helped companies in edtech, dating, D2C, and ARVR industries launch and grow products with product led growth initiatives guided by market intelligence and user behavior analytics. 
Humans have been at the core of storytelling until now. Let's talk about how they can be brought into AR. And Shreyans works for Volograms. Over to you. Brilliant. Uh, can you all see my presentation? Yep. Yeah. Great. Uh, thanks so much, uh, Heather, again, uh, for the invite. Uh, I'm following up. Uh, Damien and Florence is going to be hard. I'm going to give it a decent shot, uh, but good to be here again. Um, excited to be talking about AR and overlays and the work that we've been doing at Volograms. For jumping into that, I'll just tell a little bit more about me. So I'm Shreyans, uh, uh, I'm natively from India. I've been living in Dublin, Ireland for the last four years, leading marketing for an augmented reality, uh, virtual reality startup called Polograms. Uh, as Heather said, I've helped companies in different industries launch and scale their operations uh, across the world, help one of the companies get acquired as well. And uh, I've been working in marketing pretty much all my life, even though my background is not exactly in marketing. Uh, I studied engineering and mathematics and started my career in digital marketing back in 2013. And what really made me stick to digital marketing was the fact that I could combine uh, the creative aspects of marketing with something that I enjoyed and learned more about in my mathematics degree, which is analyzing that and being able to complete the loop of implementing something, measuring it and working on it again uh, to continuously improve and optimize whatever you are doing in marketing is, is what excited me back then, still excites me and I'm still working in marketing. I also am an ex-entrepreneur. Uh, I tried building something of my own, a direct-to-consumer e-commerce brand. I ran it for two years, uh, closed it after that, didn't run west, uh, learned a lot of things, didn't become a millionaire, uh, but here I am still <laughs> going strong. Uh, apart from that, outside of work, I started playing Ultimate Frisbee, uh, I think a year and a half ago and recently participated in my first uh, mixed nationals tournament here in Ireland. Uh, I think I've said before, but uh, it, it's something that I always thought you could play on the beach. I never thought it's, it's a competitive sport, but ever since I've started playing it, I've enjoyed it a lot. It's, it's great cardio and um, it's, it's, it's a pretty fun sport uh, in general that I hope to come continue playing for a while. Don't you just and... get dogs chasing you all the time with that sort of thing? Sorry? Don't you just get dogs chasing you all the time? Oh, no, no, no. We've got a proper pitch that we play on. <laughs> um, yeah, apart from that, uh, one of the good things about moving to Ireland, uh, closer to Europe and UK, is I've, I've been a football fan pretty much all my life, uh, and I'm getting a chance to go visit some of the best stadiums around, uh, feel the atmosphere, uh, like just watch the game with the fans, which is a completely different experience as compared to watching it back home uh, on TV. And uh, I'm on a mission to see as many stadiums as I can. Uh, recently, I was at Camp Nou, which was absolutely amazing. And uh, yeah, I started reading a book called Three Body Pop Problem. Um, it's a great mix of technology, how humans are, and politics in general. It's a three book series. And I quite like it. I'm not an avid reader, but uh, I'm quite enjoying reading that book. Uh, any kind of recommendations, if anyone has, uh, I, I'd, I'd love to hear that. Moving on, though, to what we are here for. Um, quick question to everyone here. What do you think is at the core of the video content that you create or consume uh, pretty much every day? 30 seconds for some answers. Please use the Q&A, right, uh, Heather? Or any of the panelists could shout out. Oh, there we go. Olivia's come up with video. Yes. What's at the uh, core okay. of the video content? <laughs> video. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Try again. <laughs> Story? Yeah, that's right. Oh, sir. <laughs> <laughs> well, we give them a clue, it begins with an H. <laughs> no, you might have to 
have to tell them Shreya, Shreyans. <laughs> yes. Uh, so uh, yeah, uh, I think story is like a good good segue to that, and it's about who's narrating the story. So it's humans, people, uh, real people. I think most of the content that people consume, whether it's on YouTube, Instagram, TikTok, or any other platform that you're on, you'll see humans at the center of any kind of content that you consume right now. And uh, as augmented reality and virtual reality slowly begin to seamlessly integrate with our realities, we would want, uh, and humans will still be at the center of it, and we believe that uh, bringing humans to these realities is going to be an important inflection in making these uh, new immersive medias uh, like more mainstream. But uh, that's that's the problem right now. We don't really have access to it. So developers, people who create uh, content for immersive medias right now can't really access the tech. Uh, capturing real people for AR is extremely expensive and complicated. And on the other hand, uh, as, as Warren might, might, you know, might be able to confirm as well, like creating lifelike 3D characters is really hard. And uh, whenever you create synthetic uh, characters, they're, they're either, like they either fall in the uncanny valley or are very cartoonish looking, which is great for some kind of content, but there are some times that you'd want real people in the content that you uh, want to create. And similarly, like creators don't really have options of creating with real people. I think Bitmojis are amazing. I, I use Bitmojis on Snapchat all the time. Uh, you've got the meta avatars as well. And, but as real humans, we're uh, used to interacting and learning from real people. And uh, this is why creators really need easier ways to bring real people, whether it's their friends, their family, celebrities, or just themselves uh, to what they are creating in AR. And at the same time, advertisers uh, who are creating most, like a lot of the content that we consume on a daily basis, um, the marketing campaigns that they create, fan engagement, activations, or even digital tourism, uh, tourism experiences, uh, they feature real people, but uh, only top brands can afford it right now. So there's, there's a big barrier when it comes to cost, accessibility, and lack, uh, lack of knowledge. And uh, in order for AR to move from toy to tool to totality, uh, I think as, as Snapchat uh, advanced Spiegel once uh, said it, uh, AR really needs more and more real world content, which we're trying to find the answer to, to Volu. Uh, so Volu is Volugram's uh, new app that allows you to capture people in 3D directly through your smartphone. Uh, yes, it's, it's volumetric video directly captured through smartphone. Uh, we won the award, uh, the, the best use of AI award at AWE for the app that we built. And it allows you to capture people directly through your smartphone camera, uh, just how you record a video. So you don't need dozens of cameras. You don't need green screens. You don't need server farms. You don't need specialized people who are uh, good at working with these technologies and creating content with real people or synthetic people in it. It's fairly simple. Uh, so all you do is you download the app, you capture people through your smartphone. So you record a person like you record a video inside the app. Uh, you upload that video, and our AI does the does the rest. Uh, what I uh, what our AI will do is convert that video into a three D model, which is what we call a hologram. And uh, you'll be able to download that hologram and play it inside the app and create content with it, with however you want to. Uh, you can sh you can export the holograms as well now, integrate it into platforms like Unity, uh, Unreal, Blender, uh, to create the kind of experiences that you like. And at the same time, like Damien mentioned, uh, you can do things like co-generation. I think that was the word that you used. Uh, we, we call it co-creation sometimes. So you can capture a hologram of yourself, uh, send it to anyone across the world inside the app. They can place you in their setting as they would like and then create content with you. So you don't even need to be together to create or co-generate or co-create uh, content. On top of that, uh, we have an exciting new product uh, coming out uh, soon. Uh, so building on volume and the feedback that we've received, we're now testing a new web-based solution that allows easy distribution and consumption of 
polograms. Uh, so introducing uh, polygram messages, uh, we're calling it DMs, just like DMs. Uh, it's not live yet. So it's still in testing. So I'm talking about it here, but um, uh, I request anyone here not to share about it widely. You have this like really cool information that I'm sharing with you guys right now. Uh, you do follow, you can follow us on socials to see it get launched, which is gonna be really soon. But hologram messages is a new way to captivate and engage your audience. Uh, it's, it's a replacement for the corporate videos that you can, you people create and companies create worth thousands of dollars. Uh, it can replace your sales sales videos. You can launch products through these hologram messages and just create a share worthy experience in AR. Um, it's extremely accessible. So people don't need to download a new app in order to be able to visualize something in AR. You can directly do this using web AR. And like I said, it's an alpha testing, but I've got something to show you guys here and we can, Spend a little bit of time on that. So if you just quickly scan this QR code, uh, you'll be able to experience a, a hologram message, a message demo that we've created. It's, like I said, uh, still in alpha testing. So it might not work best on Android phones. That's where we've been seeing some kind of issues. But if you've got an iPhone, uh, it will work seamlessly. I'm going to spend a minute and a half be quiet and uh, let everyone experience. Do let me know if it doesn't work for anyone. Nice. Okay. Uh, so now that everyone has the link, uh, we can probably go back to it later as well. And to make sure I finish on time, uh, I'm going to jump to the next slide. So yeah, uh, VMs are coming and uh, we've been testing it with a few people and people have been using it for multiple different use cases. Uh, as you can see on the left, uh, Ori Imbar, founder of AWE, used it as a way to invite people to the conference of sending it to the people who are going to attend, sending a fi final invite to them. Um, people have been using it in education as well. Uh, an entomologist, Molly Keck, uh, she delivered an introduction to her beekeeping course uh, through a hologram to the students of the program. And uh, they've also been using it for sales and pitching their products. Uh, so here's the founder of Poly Poly Farms uh, in a campaign that we did with Tough Chocolates in the US. Yeah, like the possibilities are endless. Uh, you can create a lot of content, different kinds of content, and it's more accessible for anyone who wants to consume this now because you just need a smartphone browser to make this work. Thank you. Uh, I'm Shreyans, happy to connect with anyone on LinkedIn. Just scan the QR code again. Thank you very much, Shreyans. That was really excellent. Um, and uh, I really like the bit at the end where you, you got the interactive man sitting next to me. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, you should never be alone. I'm going to try that later. Can, so do you have to email you to have a go or can you just go to the website and have a go at the moment? Oh, you can you can email me. Uh, there's something live on the website as well. So okay, feel cool. free to look at that. Magic. I will. Thank you. Brilliant. OK, moving swiftly on, because uh, I'm just conscious of time. That was excellent. Thank you very much. So Bethany, you're up next, if that's OK. Um, are you still all right over there in Sheffield? They're not, they're I not am. Yeah, yeah, or anything good? <laughs> no, I'm good. <laughs> excellent, excellent. Okay, let me introduce you, Bethany. Bethany is an archaeologist and digital artist who received her Master's in Archaeology of Buildings with distinction from the University of York in 2019. Her research in 3D reconstructive modelling of lost structures 
led her to found Experience Heritage, an endeavour that combines her heritage and digital media passions. Her work largely, largely focuses on 3D modelling, XR and mobile applications to educate and make heritage more immersive and accessible for groups such as the National Trust and the National Paralympics Heritage Trust. So this talk tonight from uh, Bethany will talk about AR and how it can be a non-intrusive way of bringing lost history to life. Over to you, Bethany. Thank you, Heather. Um, yeah, quite a lot of great acts to follow. So I'll keep this kind of short and sweet because um, a lot of the projects I'm going to talk about tonight have just been kind of in the planning phase. We haven't moved through with them, but they do highlight how augmented reality can really be used well in the storytelling aspect of history. Um, and as Heather said, my background is in archaeology um, and self-taught in a lot of digital uh, media. So um, that's kind of where I'm with augmented reality as well. So just getting started, but really excited about the opportunities. Um, so the first project I'm going to talk about is um, it was something that happened before COVID. Um, so this was, we were looking at English Heritage open sites and I had someone who wanted to fund a project with English Heritage. And so we were getting, trying to get them on board to create this augmented reality experience at their open sites. And if you don't know what an open site is, that means um, one of their locations where you don't have to pay for entry, you just can go on in and there's nobody manning the site. Um, but that also meant that there was um, less interpretation, less engagement with people as they go on site. And that was one of the problems that we were looking to address with the augmented reality um, opportunity. Um, and unfortunately, they didn't go for this because I think before lockdown, um, they were kind of stuck in, let's stick with what we know, let's do just kind of an audio tour like we've always done. I think if this had come along after the pandemic, I think they would have jumped on this. So it's the timing wise, it didn't work out so well, but I think um, this is definitely where heritage is going now. Um, so as I said, the problem was that th these are unmanned sites and there's minimal interpretation available. Um, so for instance, at Byland Abbey, which is what the two bottom photos are at, um, you've got ruins, but you might not have even a, a sign that tells you what that ruin used to look like, what was there, how, how big this site would have looked um, when it was all complete. So AR was a great way to create engagement um, with this lost um, physical uh, aspects of the site um, and get more people interested um, with the site. And the more people that are interested in coming back to these sites, the more donations you're going to have and the more potential for um, keeping conservation going. Um, so we were looking to inspire visitors um, by making this uh, um, come to life with immersive reality and create interactives that told stories um, and um, so we're looking to create a walking tour that would serve as their own guide throughout the site. Um, we kind of wanted to have like a guide character that would speak to people and tell people a bit a back a background background um, history on some of the, the points around the site. We were looking to do reconstructive three D modeling so people could um, look through their phone and see what the building uh, or the it would have looked like at a time at the time they could pass through the middle of the model so they could be walking right through the middle of the the church or whatever it was or they could go outside of it and kind of look around and see how it fit into the landscape we also wanted to just highlight different aspects of the buildings and um, use informational touch points to add some inf information and the great thing about English Heritage open sites is they would have, English Heritage would already have tons of information about these sites um, to provide so that we'd have lots of interactive points with um, uh, text and audio and video and that kind of thing that we could embed in the interaction. Um, yeah, I think that's pretty much um, the main points about this interaction. Um, we were hoping to also include some games and those could be educational. Um, it could be a part of an educational curriculum or they could be um, games that kind of crossed over to every site, but kind of related to English heritage and, and history in general. Um, this was also a really good way to track metrics for sites like this. Um, if you got people using this app quite a bit, you could kind of see who was going to these sites, how often, and gather um, some of those metrics about people. It was also a really good option 
for an offsite um, visit. So if people couldn't physically make it to the site, some of these are quite remote. And if people don't have a car or, or ways to get to the site, this was another option for people to learn about these sites without having to actually physically go. Um, the next one we were looking at was a lost paper mill. So what I mean by that is um, this is kind of a large site, but um, only one of the buildings remained. And there was quite a few of the historic buildings that were no longer standing. Um, the area was quite underserved and in need of kind of cultural enrichment. And they'd also had a lot of issues with vandalism in the past when they did try to put up any interpretation. So they were looking for a way to provide um, the, tell people about the significance of the site, tell the founder's story of the paper mill and tell, engage people with the past of this um, industrial area, all while not having to do anything too physical in case those same problems arose. Um, so we were looking at using archival images, which they had quite a bit of for the site um, to overlay onto the current landscape to give people a sense of what used to be. Uh, also creating reconstructive models, as I mentioned for the previous example, um, interactive points and audio. Um, we were looking at doing maybe QR codes to bring up content, but that would also kind of interact with that, that vandal issue. So um, there would be other options to launch this content um, nowadays. Um, I'm gonna kind of move through these fast because they're all very similar but they do highlight um, the different kinds of heritage sites that are looking for these kind of solutions. And, and they kind of have all very slightly different problems that they're trying to solve and, and slightly different solutions. So this one was a historical hall and um, they were wanting a way to dynamically display the long history of the hall to modern audiences. They wanted to express the significance of the site and tell its story and present its timeline of change throughout the um, about the space throughout time. So the exterior, but also the interior spaces, how were they different and changing and evolving over time? Um, and so they wanted this app to be kind of like a virtual, tra uh, virtual time travel experience. Um, similarly to the other apps, we were looking at kind of doing a trail where we'd have the augmented reality content tied in with other um, uh, video and um, audio experiences with um, archival images and clickable content that came up with augmented reality experience. The next one is a rare tabernacle um, that was a piece of the beginnings of the Methodist church in the UK. So it was quite a important historical site, but um, when you passed it, um, it was quite unimpressive um, as you can see in this, in this image there. So uh, while we were talking about this project, they were had just gotten funding to do refurbishment for the site. So it's probably much um, underway as far as the final product that they were going for now. But at the time, they really wanted a way to engage the public in the history while all that work was being completed and also help people to understand what the interior space looked like because that was gonna be not accessible for several years because of the work and because of the state that the building was in. Um, so they they also wanted to tie this, this building to the, the area. There was several buildings in the area that were kind of tied to the same story. So they wanted to create kind of a heritage trail throughout the neighborhood, but also they were quite close to the high street. And at that time, um, heritage was really focusing on rejuvenating the high streets as well. So they wanted to kind of use the momentum from that to pull people into this site as well and kind of tie it all together. Um, so similarly, we were looking for kind of creating a, a character, uh, like an animated character that would kind of tell people the story and maybe pull in children a bit and, and just serve as entertainment, but also educational um, and have the same kind of informational points and overlays. Um, and then the next one was for a historic town council. So this one would have um, spanned an entire town rather than just one site. So that was an interesting one as well. Um, uh, we do a lot of the same things, but they were, they were looking to bring kind of nearly their 3000 years of history to life through imagery and sound and engage wider audiences um, in that history and provide a modern interpretation. So um, we would have created a heritage trail with um, points around 
the town pointed out and with um, educational information that was called out on, on the app that way. And then this brings me to our personal project. This is one that we've been working on for a while and we're gonna continue working on. Um, so it's kind of a two part thing. So we're working on a, a York app tr uh, trail app that's gonna have um, a multitude of different trails that you can pick from. So it should have some, something for everyone, um, different time periods, different themes, different um, kinds of people and um, places and things like that, um, yeah, like different industries. So if you any interest you have, hopefully we'd have a trail for you. Um, and this wouldn't just be augmented reality, but it would have that as a, as a, a, a point to it. So it would be um, uh, written in video and audio content, but also these augmented reality experiences where you could um, hear from um, famous characters from York's history, um, see reconstructions of buildings that are now lost and better understand the kind of lay of the land and the scope of the buildings. Um, uh, so we were doing the York app, or we are doing the York app as a pilot for our platform that we're working on developing, which will kind of bring everything I've just talked to you about together, um, where, you know, each of these apps have very similar kind of elements to them. So we're creating a platform where it makes it a lot easier for our heritage clients to get these apps created. Um, uh, they can do a lot of the, the, the content development themselves and, and put that in there. And then um, it keeps costs down for them and um, gives them a great way to express their history to their public. That was a whirlwind tour of what we're doing over at Experience Heritage. But um, yes, yeah, so just lots of, uh, lots of potential in heritage as far as augmented reality is concerned. Thank you. God, I'm tired just listening to all the projects you've got on Bethany at the moment. That's amazing. <laughs> Uh, and really interesting to see the York one. I'm, I'll be, I'll be definitely go and have a go at that. That looks really interesting. I uh, saw so some familiar faces there of, of historical characters. So, so yeah. great. Well, thank you very much, folks. That was um really interested in diverse ways that people are using AR, uh, both in education, um, in heritage, you know, for fun, in terms of commercial um, and marketing, you know, just and also in terms of the kind of inner workings and with and with comics, you know. So really interesting, just the different ways that you're using these um, AR elements to to overlay or not, <laughs> in your case, Damien, um, you know, to, to work with um, the publications and, and the products that you are either selling or, or raising awareness of. So so thank you very much for that. OK, let's see if we've got any questions yet. I think you answered the one from Olivia already, didn't you? Yeah, you have. OK. Um, Olivia is asking, will AR take off more with the general public than other XR forms, do you think? Anyone can start. <clears throat> I'll start with that. Um, I I think augmented reality is so much more accessible to people than VR, for instance. Um, there's a multitude of reasons that people don't use VR, including motion sickness and um, different um, just sensibilities to um, light and movement and things like that. So um, yeah, I, I, I do think as far as those two are concerned, augmented reality is already um, making much more sense. Mm -hmm. It makes sense as well. Everyone's got a smartphone practically these days as well. So you've not got that barrier to entry buying a headset, have you? So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, I, I agree with uh, Bethany. I think like accessibility is like one of the biggest factors in uh, making anything as, as as big as the smartphone right now. And like if you can make AR accessible through phone, uh, that's that's the biggest win. And combining that with a multitude of things that we do nowadays, whether, whether it's like cooking or running or mm -hmm. uh, even working, talking to someone, uh, AR can really just how it says uh, augment your experience in uh, whatever you are doing. So uh, definitely see more potential in AR right now as compared to VR. But uh, uh, again, VR has its own benefits in uh, how it can help people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And you were mentioning that in your last talk as well, Sriyan, that Apple sort of seen downloading an app as a, a barrier to accessing technology on your smartphone. So anything that streamlines that makes it as accessible as possible, which it looks like your hologram messaging um, is, is the case for as well. You know, you don't need to download the app. It's just there. It automatically just appears, which is really accessible. Yeah, that's right. Like that's that's one of the pieces of feedback that we've been constantly getting from people as well. Uh, as nice uh, as it is to 
download an app and get some like get a new app on your phone i think people do get tired after a while uh, downloading a new app or not seeing an experience exactly how uh, like when they want to mm-hmm. i think the uh, you can call it people becoming more impatient or uh, uh, just demanding more of anything that they see or uh, do mm-hmm. so uh, web ar makes it really easy and uh, with the compatibility becoming better through uh, different platforms like atwal zapar uh, and other no code platforms uh, i think ar might be here to stay for mm-hmm. better yeah Brilliant. did you want to add to that warren you had your hand up Yes, thank you, Ada. Yeah, no, I think I, I, I agree with Bethany and uh, Sheree um, that, yeah, the AR will be, I think, a much more kind of applicable kind of communication tool. I think what's interesting is, um, you know, as we probably look to the future, I think Damien kind of alluded to it being transhuman. So these things kind of interconnect with us in a different way as well. Um, and it's quite interesting that uh, Apple, um, are going to be releasing, well, supposed to be releasing the new wearable AR headset in June. So, um, I think it's installed actually. Sorry, <laughs> it's been what? Has it? All oh, right, okay. Sorry, <laughs> I, um, I, 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 sorry, I'm completely wrong on that. But yeah, I think I think the questions are, you know, there's, there's multiple questions when you when we're using AR though in public spaces, mm-hmm. um, you know, even you know, with education, all sorts of other things is, you know, this, this, I don't know if you've seen Keisha Matsuda's work, but that's, you know, in terms of overload of information, um, you know, ethics implications and how we do navigate that because we're, we're navigating in a different way. So, um, but I, but yes, yeah, I, I think um, AR seems to be the kind of, seems to be more of a, a progression into the way that we could communicate in the future, definitely. Okay. Uh, Olivia's asking, will AR and VR merge into one or will they always be separate? Will the advent of goggles include both functions, 3D objects, hand tracking, etc.? Isn't that what Metaverse is? <laughs> no. Uh... <laughs> is it in the Metaverse, the space you get to through the goggles? <laughs> <laughs> no, I think that's a good question. Um, it's, it, it's, it's like a, a as for me, I don't think that they're, they're going to merge into one. AR is being in the same space you are, but uh, adding objects to it, adding things to it to augment your experience, whereas VR takes you into a completely new space, mm-hmm. um, which is which which you cannot recognize, which is not what you're around. So um, you might see things slowly moving you you might have a, a time when there are so many things in ar that it does not look like your space at all mm-hmm. but uh, still vr would look like a completely different space mm-hmm. uh, it would not it would still not be me sitting here and uh, feeling like i'm sitting in my parents living room i think that's going to be more virtual reality mm-hmm. still it's interesting we had a htc vive on last night for one of the sessions and they were talking about the kind of color pass through you're getting now the new year headsets um, and the fact that they were skinning um, games and experiences to fit inside your living room or, or the rooms of your house. And then they were adapting depending on which room you happen to be in. So it's almost like, I wonder, Olivia, whether you're thinking about the the tech making it, enabling AR and VR, as opposed to the two existing in the same space. But, you know, with that motion pass through being in color and being able to skin over the objects in your living room, that might feel more like AR, perhaps. I don't know. Anyway, <laughs> we'll move on. <laughs> OK, so in terms of the educational tools, um, what scope is there um, in terms of the site? You've talked about science. You've talked a bit about um, heritage uh, and in terms of the educational tools. Are there any other particular subjects that might lend themselves to this type of learning tool? I think this, sorry, Ellen. Uh, sorry, Heather. Right. Um, am I right? Do you want me to answer that one? Yeah, just chuck it. Just, Is that okay? I'd, yeah, I'm having I, a cup I, of tea and a bun in your living yeah. room. <laughs> just chuck it in, yeah, whenever. 
I, I think I think education, yeah, there's multiple things. I mean, like what Beth Bethany's just shown, which is great, fantastic, you know, the way that you can use the media for that. Mm -hmm. Um, but yeah, I mean there's 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 medical, uh, I mean, even the mili military are using it. Um, but I think there's some really some great kind of ways and examples of training people as well so not just kind of it, you know you can have an educational content but i think the, i think vr both vr and R, vr and ar there's some great examples of how you can train employees and um you know where there may be risk so with these kind of platforms there's no risk to it um but i think yeah i think you know from kind of vr labs to geolocation stuff i think there's so much potential um and you know i think it'll just get bigger and bigger and bigger what do you think shreyans what about in the context of your new volagram messaging uh where you're actually physically putting up an ar person in a in a space can you see there being any applications in education for that um, we've not, uh, yeah, like one, one of the things, like I mentioned, uh, we've, we've done, we've tested is uh, someone creating an intro to a, a, an education program that they've built. Uh, and apart from that, we've done another project in the past, which wasn't exactly done as part of hologram messages, but uh, we combined with the school and uh, worked with, I think what was called Inspiring Women Project. Um, where we captured holograms of uh, scientists of the past to encourage kids in the school to take up STEM courses. And um, but seeing things from the past, seeing stories from the past can really help students visualize themselves uh, in, in potentially becoming uh, a version of them, uh, a version of who they are seeing. So, it can also be used for inspiration. It can be used for introductions. Uh, it can, yeah, it, it can augment uh, their, their experience, their education experience in a, uh, multiple ways possible too. I think also in terms of learning, just having multiple modes of, of engaging people and, and switching between them often uh, just keeps people's attention and get, you know, creates a scenario where they're, 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 they're kind of breaks them out of that falling asleep cycle. <laughs> yeah. Engaged in, in the content that you're trying to teach them, I guess. <laughs> And so, some of my cousins are already complaining about how their kids are on phones anyway. Yeah. So uh, might as well use AR to <laughs> make their lives better. Yeah, that's fair enough. That's fair enough. Okay, so have geolocation AR games like Pokemon Go made augmented reality more mainstream? And if so, what is it that's actually the key attraction? I'll start on that. Um, I think because it was so popular, it just gives people an inroad to say like, what is augmented reality? Oh, you know, po po Pokemon Go. Like there's been so many times where it's like, I don't know how to explain this, but everyone knows what that is. So it's just been helpful in that way to kind of mainstream the technology and, and make it accessible to people. Cause I think if there hadn't been such a popular tool um, to this point, I think it would be, I just don't think a lot of people would have embraced it as much as they have. What is it that's got people so excited about it though? Is it the cartoon element, do you think? Or is it the gamification of it? Or the winning of the points? Or is it just the novelty value because it hasn't hadn't been done before? Was it just kids to having something to do on their phones while their parents are trips around <laughs> like cities and towns? <laughs> question. I don't know if somebody else knows. I don't know anything about Pokemon. It just seems like it was Pokemon itself that made it popular, but I'm not sure. Yeah. Olivia saying finally been able to catch them all. <laughs> Fair enough. Okay. Um, Olivia's asking, are there any limitations to who can experience AR? Are there any accessible restrictions that could come up in AR other than not having a current day smartphone? That you know of. There is um, a restriction in um age limits so i think because i'm working with primary children we have to use tablets we can't use wearable tech um and generally the ethical um implications of it is 12 upwards to be wearing wearable tech mm -hmm. generally um so yeah there are limitations with that um however i don't know if that will change in time but um yeah 
um, that's one thing just to bear in mind. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's a great point. And uh, I think on top of that, uh, good internet speed is, uh, is also sometimes uh, important in being able to experience some of these immersive experiences that have been created because uh, a lot of these files, a lot of these experiences that are created on different platforms uh, are not as small in file size as compared to what we are experiencing now, say on YouTube uh, or any content platforms. Uh, our current technologies or streaming technologies are very well adept to streaming a video on YouTube. Mm -hmm. But if you want to experience anything in AR, file sizes are bigger and therefore it needs more bandwidth or better internet for it to work seamlessly. Mm -hmm. um, I think you can still work on it sometimes with some a certain kind of lag, but for it to work seamlessly, you might need better internet connections mm -hmm. or better internet speeds. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And what effect do you see um, the onset of, of Apple's glasses when they finally launched, not in June, but sometime shortly after? Um, what sort of uh, effect do you think that's going to have on the growing AR market? Uh, well, everyone is watching Apple because Apple has this ability to legitimize the market. So um, I, I know that there's a lot of money in AR now, and I think a lot of people are holding back until that market is built because this is number one consideration for a lot of companies. So um, if Apple lands, then that's going to open the floodgates. If it doesn't land, then I imagine that people will hold back a little bit until they're more confident. So it's going to have a severe impact. All eyes are on Apple now. Mm -hmm. And do you think there's enough content behind the actual hardware in order that, you know, once it launches, it's going to have some traction, do you think? That's a better question. Um, that's what happened with Magic Leap. Magic Leap didn't have enough content when they put their stuff out and nobody used it and nobody adopted it. Um, I really don't know. You probably... Um, the, the other guys here are creating AR content, so they would probably be in a better position to, to answer that. What do you guys think? I think, um, sorry, I think, yeah, Damon's completely right um, about the content as well. Um, so what was the question again, Heather? I'm just completely... asking about it, so that's fine, no, don't worry. Uh, I was asking, like, when, when Apple finally launched their smart glasses, yeah. Um, and you've got these yes. things. Are we just going to end up with an iWatch yeah. on our faces, basically, or are we going to yeah. have more exciting content than that for us to be able to play yeah. with pretty much off the bat? Or do you think, um, I mean, would the kinds of AR um, objects and, and products that you guys are um, producing, would they translate, do you think, into mm. smart glasses fairly easily? I think, I think, yeah, I think with Apple, as Damien quite rightly said, I think, you know, when you, all eyes are on Apple because not, it's not always the content it's the product mm -hmm. as well so what are the styles going to be like is it cool you know there's a lot of um, ar glasses out there but um and but yeah i think you know once again magic leap um there was a lot of hype and then when they launched it eventually that it didn't distribute mm -hmm. enough around so there was not enough developers mm -hmm. um and they're still obviously still going mm -hmm. but yeah i think the content i think with ai as well when when we look at that, which is quite interesting, is content now is becoming quicker to create. Mm -hmm. And what was years ago something where you'd have to use certain tools, I think people now are becoming much more um, the creators, as so to speak. Mm -hmm. So people can become much more creative and, and create. And um, so AI is enabling people to model things, to do things far quicker than you know we ever expected so i think that married with ar and the way that we're going i think you'll start to see some really kind of interesting things but i think you know absolutely right um you know if apple launch it and it doesn't kind of take off then um where does ar then sit and but you know we've seen this with the website and internet where people said oh the internet you know it was launched and it's never going to take off and then you know here we are today so um I think, you know, technology is a very kind of, and timing is a very kind of tricky thing. And when you get them right, they work perfectly. When you don't, you, you have bumps and... Uh, glasses. Yeah, <laughs> totally. <laughs> anyway. 
yeah yes. no that's cool no that's cool thank you um i was just going to say um olivia's put a question in uh the chat other than vaforia what other applications or libraries could be used for something in a unity scene um i think um if it'd be interesting look at niantic wayfarer at the moment they're in test flight mode still but um that's they you get a plug in for niantic into unity um and it might be worth looking at that and i know it's free and and they built pokemon go and i know they're building an entire library where you can drop your ar elements in a world map um and they just sit there ready so you could actually you could use your uh, product as well Sriyan, um using niantic um wayfarer and actually drop your stuff around the world so that might be one to think about olivia yeah. and ar kit and ar core i think are another two but you guys probably know a lot more about this than i do i don't know if you've got any ideas Have I covered most of the main ones, maybe? So check them out, Olivia. She's like, I really want to do an AR project now. Yeah, but I mean, it's a really interesting space, actually. And and uh, and we need to be ready for the smart glasses coming out so that we've got something cool and fun to play with when, when we get there. OK, um, what else have we got? Um, when do overlays and AR become intrusive? And have you got any examples, maybe, of when they have become intrusive? I would say um, if if you look at Keisha Matsuda's work, I don't know if you've ever seen it. Probably you have, but Keisha Matsuda um, is released two kind of uh, videos, and it kind of um, gives an impression as how we may live with AR around us. And um, it's really interesting because you know, from a work perspective, to going shopping in the supermarket, um, you can see all these overlays of content. Mm -hmm. And in some ways, it's kind of a con maybe a content overload. Mm -hmm. um, so, yeah, I think we have to be really careful how we provide information, because at the moment, you know, when we look at flat screens and our, our phones, to then having some spatial kind of things flying around us mm -hmm. um, in 3D or 2D or whatever it may be. It's a very, very different kind of experience. And it could, like, if we're all looking at it, it could just become this model and what are we really focusing on mm -hmm. and i think that's some of the thing that i was working with on this project um that it's all great and this these things that can happen but you know there's only so much that we can digest mm -hmm. information wise so um, mm -hmm. so yeah so the question saying is that also known as the journalist that piece of work do you know It, um, no, you get, you get off a bus and there's just stuff everywhere. Hyper, hyper something. I'll come back. Okay, <laughs> that's fair enough. And uh, one, one last question then before we run out of time, and this one's for you, Bethany. Um, how can AR? Well, you've already told us how AR can be used to interpret history, but do you think this is going to mark the end of the audio tour guide? Or do you think <laughs> there's hope for them yet? I, <laughs> uh, I mean. Never have I been a fan of audio tours, so I guess I would say I hope so. But no, um, no, I think there's always there's always people who are going to prefer different ways of um, getting this information. And when uh, when we asked about kind of are there barriers to using AR, I think one place I always I'm guilty of like leaving this behind is that I, I do a lot of visual stuff, but there is people who can only take this stuff in auditorially. So um, it's remembering to create those uh, immersive and augmented experiences for every people from every walk of life. So um, no, I think I don't think it's going to replace it. But um, I think it's just another another way of uh, and I think there's going to be uses depending on the case and the, and the need. So yeah. I'm thinking holograms might make a new tour guide actually in a lot of these places. Yeah, I was yeah, little people at <laughs> Let's talk. Yeah, about exactly. Yes, definitely. <laughs> okay, so it's two minutes to the end. So I'm going to stop asking you questions now. You'll be pleased to know. Um, and uh, just to say a big thank you once again, uh, especially to you, Bethany and Damien and Anshri Yans. You've all been here multiple times, and I do really appreciate you taking the time to come out um, and and help us and support the festival. It's been really insightful and interesting to hear the exciting stuff you guys are up to um and i do really appreciate your time and also to you warren who you dropped in at the last minute with to tell us about the work that you're doing with ciec um and the primary science enhancement program so really interesting to see that work as well um and, and also to see that they're still alive and kicking so that's great and thank you to our audience especially olivia for your really interesting questions 
Um, and thank you to our sponsor, Sign, once again for uh, sponsoring the event. And I keep saying it because I want them to sponsor one in the future. Um, hint, hint. Uh, anyway, thank you very much, guys. Um, I'll see some of you again. Um, for the ones of you who I won't see again, um, I really appreciate your efforts and your time. And, uh, and Olivia also says thanks to everyone as well. Okay, I'll see you later. Have a fantastic evening. Take care. Thanks. Good to see you, everyone. Bye-bye. Bye. That's it.